So first of all, Karen, congratulations on your new job. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I have to say I'm very excited. Still here at Jefferson till June 1st, but very excited about joining ACS. That's amazing. So this is a lot to process. Uh, your career is in a really good place right now. You're, you're a cancer center director. You are ACI president. Um, you are on BSA. Uh, and, um, and also, you know, in your spare time, you managed to get an MBA. Um, so, oh, of course, you're also a, a funded, in, an age funded investigator. I forgot this is that true. true. So uh, ACS, on the other hand, is a place that has been losing its gross receipts. They've been eroding since uh, 2007. Well, actually other organizations that are comparable have been growing. Uh, so why do you take the CEO position at, uh, at a place that's really going down while your career is a really nice spot? Well, so, you know, great question as always. Uh, you know, I think probably the most important aspect of what it is that I do that led me to ACS is in fact leading the cancer care and cancer discovery mission at, at Jefferson Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. Um, you know, ACS has had an incredibly positive impact on the operation that I run in Philadelphia. So my microcosm of experience with ACS has given me just this incredible perspective, but also incredible respect for the organization. Um, you know, ACS exists because the, the burden of cancer in this country is unacceptably high. And they believe something I believe, which is that we can improve lives through cancer research, through advocacy, and through direct patient support mechanisms that, that enhance the lives of cancer patients and their families. All of those things are true in Philly. Uh, and, and I've experienced that as the leader of this large cancer operation. So when ACS called and said that they had a vision for the future to further enhance what it is that they do and take experiences like mine in Philadelphia and ensure that that is permeating optimally throughout the nation, I, I listened. And the more that I met with the board, the more that I understood the impact of ACS and, and what the organization is and what the organization can be, the more enthusiastic I became. So in a nutshell, you know, I, I, I really looked at this seriously uh, because of what the impact of ACS can and is uh, in this nation. And I, I fully believe that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Joe Simone used to say leadership matters. Um, and you're leaving Thomas Jefferson. Uh, what have you accomplished there? Uh, you've brought it you know, back from the brink, really. Um, what have you accomplished there? What's, what are you leaving behind? What's yeah, there? this this is in fact the hardest part without question uh, of, of going to the American Cancer Society is leaving behind the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. I love my team. And at the end of the day, the strength of what we've done at Jefferson is the team that we've built that's allowed this expansion and greater impact on the community. You know, from the NCI perspective, we've really grown. We've you know more than doubled the research funding, now more than $80 million in research funding coming in for cancer any given year. We were ranked outstanding for the first time by the NCI in our last renewal. We're one of two nationally ranked cancer programs in, in the greater Philadelphia region. But our, without question, our most important impact has been really shifting our focus so that decisions are guided and resources allocated by the needs of the patients who, whom we serve. That's everything from how it is that we distribute research funds to how it is that we organize. So. We, you know, we went from a single hospital system in, in Philadelphia Center City now to three advanced care hubs out in the region, all with clinical trials, all tailored toward you know, those patients in the region, opened the first men's genetic risk clinic in the US uh, and, and continued to, to innovate, really inspired by, by my CEO, uh, Steve Clasco, uh, you know, who has really encouraged us to take creativity, innovation, and novel partnerships toward the greater good and given us uh, a real license in cancer to, to follow those dreams and they've, and they've borne fruit. So, you know, we've more than tripled the number of cancer patients that we're serving and, and the access to advanced care and clinical trials out in the community was a dream that we were able to realize underneath Steve. 
So what I really came to appreciate at Jefferson is, you know, through building this, this large multi-state service line and seeing it integrated beautifully with research, but having all of our decisions guided by what's right for the patient is a discipline and competency that, that I hope to bring as, as the CEO of the American Cancer Society. Mm -hmm. But leaving the place behind like that, can it do okay without you? Can it sail without you? I think they're going to be terrific. You know, the, the day that I, I uh, you know, spoke to Steve Clasco and said, you know, I'm, I'm making this transition. Uh, I also said, and by the way, here's my plan. Um, you know, here's the plan for SKCC from the research and from the service line side. There will be a national search for my replacement. I serve uh, uh, many roles two of which are the director of the cancer center and one is the executive vice president of oncology services. So I think it's a, it's going to be a terrific position for someone to walk into um, because it's doing so well. Uh, and because of leaders like Steve Clasco and Bruce Meyer who had the, the health system, um, you know, just really embracing what it is that that cancer center can be. And so the, the team is just, they're fantastic. They're gonna be terrific. And what I've said to them is that we'll be sole partners. This is a, you know, one of the things that ACS can and should take advantage of is greater partnerships with cancer centers. Example, mm -hmm. so in the underserved areas that I have as part of my catchment area right now here in Philadelphia, I have 16% of my patients will miss chemo or radiation therapy in any given year because they don't have transportation. So we bend over backwards to find resources and ways to support patients to get them to treatment. ACS has the same goal. We, we, they are one of our key partners in providing transportation for our patients. This is an area where we can really work together for creative new strategies, to build new alliances toward resourcing how it is that we get patients to treatment and improve access to care. At the end of the day, the cancer centers care deeply about achieving equity in cancer care. You know, this is a, a passion of mine as well. ACS also holds that value. So finding ways to work together with cancer centers, pharma and other partners, I think has to be part of the strategy moving forward for ACS. Mm -hmm. If I may, I find um, the, well, if anybody can make this happen, if anybody can turn ACS around, it's you. Uh, but what is ACS? Uh, how do you, what are the problems? How do you expect to address them? Yeah. So, you know, I'll certainly learn more after June 1 when I walk in the door as CEO. But from, you know, from my experience, what I know from, from learning from the outside, uh, you know, it appears to me that ACS has, has had some of the typical types of issues that happen when organizations that have been around, around as long as ACS has evolve and go through transformation. Some of those challenges were internally generated. Some were due to external factors beyond their control that, you know, they, that, you know, they are still in the process of adapting to. But one of the, the biggest challenges that I see in the history of ACS, which I feel um, a, an empathy and sympathy for, is this move from a federated model where ACS lived in a lot of different places with different missions and different strategies to a single organization functioning under a single mission. This is a journey I understand very well, given all of the consolidation in healthcare and the growth of Jefferson from three hospitals to 14, and therefore the, the cancer program and cancer research mission blooming out into those areas. It's not simple. It's not a journey that happens in one year. And so I think ACS is ready for that next phase to truly complete the journey of a single organization with new leadership to make strategic choices that are based with the patient at the center and to use unique partnerships to really accelerate that mission. I also think there's a sense of urgency that's going to help ACS in this next phase. As we start to emerge from the pandemic, we hope. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that there are you know, thousands of individuals in the US who skip screening that are going to present, and we're starting to see this now, of patients presenting with more advanced disease ACS has a long history of promoting patient education as part of their support mission, 
and promoting screening events. We're very thankful to them for partnering with us on screening events. They have to be part of the solution of, of reducing the cancer burden in the post-pandemic world. That sense of urgency I see throughout the leadership of ACS uh, and I'm sure exists in all aspects of the, or the organization. So it's just yet another reason that I think ACS is so critical uh, in the current and future environment. Mm -hmm. So that's a purpose, a sense yeah. of purpose that wasn't there and COVID has created that, right? It, I, I think it's really heightened that sense of purpose on prevention and screening, which is part of the patient support component uh, of ACS. And so, but yes, I think having that, that sense of purpose that's centered around the patient and their family to improve the lives of patients and their families through the three pillars that hold up ACS, discovery, advocacy, and patient support that really differentiates this organization from you know, similar organizations with, with whom they partner and share uh, interests, for example, in cancer research funding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, nothing is gonna happen unless the board's uh, on board uh, and hiring you was, was, was something that is probably a good omen, I'm opining again. But do you think the board has uh, the vision right now it hasn't always had the vision of ACS. That's kind of like I would hang most of the problems or a lot of the problems on the board as, as it was meandering and changing in every which way. Is it now stable enough to actually give you direction and, uh, and kind of engage with you in the way one responsibly engages with the CEO? Is that happening now that what, the thing that wasn't happening before? Hmm. I, so I looked at, the, all I can say is, is what's happening now, you know, at ACS. And I looked at this, of course, very carefully, the relationship between management and governance is so important for the health of, an, of any organization, but ACS in particular. Uh, so I've had quite a lot of interaction to date with the board, and it's been, I would say, uniformly positive. I, uh, I think I have a reputation for transparency and openness and, um, and, and you know, certainly shared with them my vision for ACS uh, along the lines of what we just talked about, the patient centricity and refining our focus and on a, you know, true patient impact. Uh, they, I, what I found in the board was an enthusiastic group that shared the vision that, uh, you know, that spoke to me in ways that really energized me. Um, talked about the desire to bring new creativity, innovation to spar with the board and, and come out with the greatest ideas. I'm used to this from the board at Jefferson and am very enthusiastic about working with them. So as much as the time as I've spent with the board, I'm really anxious in the post June one world to start to get to move on um, and, and to spend the first several weeks and months in a listening tour. ACS is everywhere, right? They have 3,500 employees, 1.5 million volunteers, they're in six regions. Uh, and I'm a believer that good ideas can come from anywhere. You know, as a many decades funded scientist with a really phenomenal research um, staff to work with, I realize that good ideas can come from anywhere. And so I'm really looking forward to everyone from senior leadership to the volunteer of listening and helping to shape that vision, that, that ten, the tentative vision that we've put together and set it into motion as quickly as possible for this, this next phase of ACS. How long is the listening tour? I think the listening tour, you know, is certainly, it's going to be however long it takes me to get out to these six regions in the world of COVID, but I do want to physically visit. Um, and the, but the listening tour can't last too long. Uh, you know, I'd like to learn quickly um, and then have those important conversations throughout the organization. I'd say, you know, in the first in the first three months, um, you know, we'd like to, to come out with a solid next strategic plan for the ACS. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would think that uh, the fact that you got the job, I, I cannot imagine that in your interviews with the board, you would have been anything but blunt about <laughs> what's going on. So, that is my reputation, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yet they still hired you, which is a good thing. <laughs> you know, they, you know, they did. On board. <laughs> I might be blushing because, you know, there, there were, but I, I really enjoyed it. You know, again, as a scientist by training, we thrive in peer review, right? We thrive from having objective feedback from each other. I tell my lab all the time, the way that you show love to people that you work with is by challenging their concepts and really making sure that they've thought through it. Do they have a good strategy or is an alternative plan? As a scientist, that's how we show the love. 
And mm-hmm. as a leader, that's how we've developed an effective team at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. I mean, this massive expansion that we've undergone, consolidation and organization from a federated to an organizational model came from having these kinds of transformative discussions with your leaders all the way through, you know, everyone on the staff. And so I really think that they got a chance to know who I am. Um, And I'm really optimistic about working with the senior leadership team and the board, um, you know, towards shaping these next few years. Creativity and innovation is is part of what they were looking for. And I hope that's one of the things I bring to the table. I'm opining here again. Uh, I'm sorry, but but this is the probably the biggest change that place has had since Mary Lasker bought it and took it over from these crazy conservative surgeons who didn't believe in government funding and research. Well, you know, it is, it is a change, right? So, so it turns out in doing a little bit of digging in history that there actually was a scientist at some point who was leading ACS in 1945, a Dr. Little. Apparently there was not um, a lot of detailed planning of, you know, what, what it is that Dr. Little did. So I might not, I, I'm not 100% sure I'm the first, yeah. but, but in, in recent times, I'm, I'm the one who's most connected to academic oncology. Uh, and, and I really would like to think that that's in part, um, you know, why it is that, that, uh, that I was selected as CEO, but it's certainly some, something that gives me what I think are, are good competencies for leading, you know, the organization, you know, to your point, I, I still have a very active funded lab, which I will still keep my professorship at Jefferson and, you know, transition my lab out, you know, to other investigators and those, those grants and ideas to other investigators at Jefferson. But we've been really fortunate to, to, you know, in the way that we lead the lab is to really focus on what are the current clinical problems. We're very tightly connected to the clinic. And in my case, for my lab, it's advanced prostate cancer. So, you know, we've been very fortunate to make discoveries that have contributed to new approvals and new uh, understanding of disease. Uh, you know, our ability to, to translate into clinical trial is something that we're very thankful for because of the environment at Jefferson. And then, you know, that care delivery component of what it is that I do in leading the cancer center has given me an entirely new appreciation over the last almost seven years of the challenges of really delivering equitable cancer care. Our catchment area for Jefferson is a seven county catchment area. Seven counties doesn't sound like a lot, but that population, when you add it up, if it was a state, would be the 25th largest state in the United States. So we serve this dense heterogeneous population with a high degree of cancer incidence and cancer mortality that outstrips the nation, that outstrips either the, the state of Pennsylvania or the state of New Jersey. So we've got a lot of challenges. And so understanding with those and working with ACS as one of our partners to mitigate those has really given me good insight into what the challenges are nationally. Philadelphia really, I think, is a microcosm of the world. I'm a known Philadelphia lover. So there's some bias in there, but I actually believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I I brought this forward with all the other cancer centers and as part of my presidential initiative at AACI to really turn the attention toward what are all of us doing to mitigate cancer disparities and what, what can the cancer centers do? What do they need to do in partnership with organizations like ACS? And how much, you know, success have we had? What works, what doesn't? I still do hope to complete, although I will have to step down as president of AACI, I'd still hope to complete that first aspect of the cancer disparities um, project. But, but certainly, I, you know, I, I hope that these competencies uh, will be an asset um, to ACS as we go through and, and really sharpen the priorities toward uh, near-term patient impact. Mm-hmm. What, what happens to BSA? You're still there, right? You can I, am, I will still be on the board of scientific advisors. I have to, spoken briefly to Dr. Sharpless about this. I believe that to be true. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just AACI's bylaws require you to run a cancer center in order to stay on. So I'm very sorry to leave my cancer disparities project behind, but I have had a chance to speak briefly to Dr. Lerman, um, who is the president-elect who will be coming after me. And she and I are talking about unique ways to combine my presidential initiative on understanding and mitigating cancer disparities with her proposed presidential initiative, which I won't unveil, I'll let her do that. Um, But there's there's some synergy there. And so we'll continue to work together in different ways.
So she will end up serving two terms essentially, or term and a half. So I believe so. Um, so you know, she'll she'll need to ascend to the presidency more quickly. There'll likely be uh, an election more quickly than than normal um, for that. So she won't serve two terms as a president. It's more that she'll she'll need to ascend to the presidency. Um, more quickly than she had anticipated. Poor thing, and she's going through her site visit right now. So I, I feel that I have piled on to Dr. Lerman, um, my, my, my sister Karen, as we call each other. Uh, it's not a good year to be a Karen, but um, <laughs> I know we, we hate that. Well, you're both cold, no problem. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we, we both, you know, we both just are out to buck the trend and, and eradicate that, uh, you know, that stigma. But She's um she's ready for it. She's wonderful. She's going to be yeah. a terrific president of AACI. Oh, I'm sure it'll be terrific. Uh, so getting back to ACS for a moment, um, just sort of thinking back, you know, when um, when the centralization of ACS was happening, uh, one of the old time volunteers, uh, Helene Brown, uh, whom I'm, I guess you haven't had a chance to meet, she just died fairly recently, and Jerry Yates was also uh, a believer in this. We're cautioning that ACS is separating itself from the culture and the political sort of structures and the grassroots that are created. So essentially, it's like a tree snipping its own roots, which is why how some some of these folks, certainly Helene, would have uh, explained the, the withering away of ACS while other places like, say, St. Jude kept growing. Um, do, uh, also, I think recently some of the real estate has been sold, including Hope Lodges, for example. Um, do you agree with critics like, let's say, Helene or, uh, or, or Jerry? Uh, how do you see going forward with this? How do you energize the grassroots if uh, it's a kind of a centralized model? Rather? Yeah. Uh, you know, my answer to that question might have been different six years ago, seven years ago. But after having gone through now, you know, almost seven years of consistent merger and acquisition, where, you, you know, each time there's a new acquisition, you really are going from a federated model to, uh, to an organizational model. It's not simple. Um, it is a journey that evolves over time and that cements itself with trust. And the trust comes from achievement. So, and, and really aligning strategies so that the individual sites are thinking globally, but acting locally. There is a way to thread that needle so that everyone is functioning toward a single mission. Let's improve the lives of cancer patients and their families. And we're gonna do it through advocacy, patient support and, uh, and discovery. That's okay. But then fine tailoring what that means for Philadelphia versus Los Angeles or Iowa. Is, is very achievable. That I feel probably the most comfortable about of anything. I, I really understand how that process goes. And ACS, I feel like has to just complete that journey and, and there's a path forward. You know, the ACS, they're correct in that ACS started off with this, you know, very grassroots mission, right? The women's field army that were knocking on doors. Well, knocking on doors in 2021 is probably not a solid plan, but thinking locally is. So, where, so what does local mean now? It doesn't mean neighborhoods. People's communities mean very different things now. It can mean their online community, how patients connect to each other because they have a common disease or a common interest or a common concern. So ACS's new, you know, new strategy or refined strategy really has to go to where the, the patients and their families live, work, and play uh, and understanding that. So it's a different kind, I, I'd say, of grassroots that needs to happen. But, but again, as we talked about before, my leadership style is that all the, you know, the good ideas and shaping of vision have to include uh, bottom-up and top-down strategies. So not just at the listening tour, but you know, one of the, the goals for me personally as the CEO of the American Cancer Society is to stay connected to those local needs. I've come to realize the value of that as well at Jefferson. So if I sat in my office in Center City, Philadelphia, 365 days a year, I would become pretty disconnected with these outlying advanced care hubs that, we've, that we have stood up that are you know, hours away from, from my office. That would be a problem. Um, I don't anticipate, uh, you know, I anticipate having that same kind of philosophy at ACS, which is to be not just in touch with you know, the local groups, but also to be one of them 
and to have their and experience firsthand what it is that they're trying to accomplish in their different geographies. Yeah, well, leadership does matter in something like that because you can't you can't just be a functionary and do this. But um, the other thing that is kind of um, amazing to me is 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 that how little ACS has been spending on research. And while most people believe it spends a lot of money on research, um, and also really in recent cuts, uh, staff staff cuts, the the intramural program, uh, research program, which is really some of the best patient, some of the best population science um, in America has been decimated. How do you build that up? What do you, do you think you can spend more money on research? Do you think you can do more for the intramural program? How are you gonna, how are you going? I'm not even asking you whether you're going to bring it back. I'm asking how are you going to bring it back? Yeah, this has been an important core of ACS. It's the case that, uh, you know, I need to learn more about why decisions were made and what the pl current plan is moving forward, you know, in post June 1. There's new leadership, uh, you know, that oversees that research pillar. And so understanding what the vision is of, of that senior leadership team, I think is going to be really important. Um, what I do think is that all of the, you know, if, if ACS in the, in the simplest form stands on these three pillars of research discovery, advocacy, and patient support, finding ways for these to optimally synergize with each other has to be a way. But I, I will say, uh, you know, without question, right? I'm a scientist, I have benefited from ACS funding, not personally, but as a cancer center director, having those pilot funds to let bold new research directions um, take flight, especially from junior investigator, early career investigators, is, has been mission critical. We can point to those and say, you know, that, that went right to clinical trial and it's been impactful. So I think telling the story about the impact of ACS funded research has to be part of, of what it is moving forward so that we're more effectively communicating to stakeholder groups what the value is of the research mission and how that relates to things that the advocacy group is really focused on like, like cancer equity or access to care. Um, you know, all of these things really need to tie together so that ACS is making strategic choices for the highest and best use of the, the valuable funds and time and resources that go into the organization. So do you think you're going to give more money to research or can you? I mean, I'm sure it takes the board as well, but can you, uh, do you see yourself upping that uh, uh, investment or not? Yeah, well, you know, this is this is what we'll decide in the in the next strategic plan after the listening and learning tour. Research is a core tenant of ACS, and it, it you know it has to be. And and so you know again working with this, I, I don't want to speak for the relatively new leader in the, in the research team, but I'd like to understand what that strategic goal has looked like, how it intersects with the overall um, goals of ACS and the mission of ACS. But research has to has to continue to be. Uh, one of the core mission and values of ACS. If they if they truly believe, uh, as I, I know that they do, that they can improve lives, research is a key component of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally, I'm, I'm full confidence in the fact that you, you get that. <laughs> so um, what, um, uh, where do you see ACS a year from now, three years from now, five years? 10 is probably too much to ask for, but three years. I don't know. Let's, 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 let's go. Let's be aspirational. I like this. This is good. You know, time. yeah. It, you know, in one year, we will certainly have, uh, you know, a new strategic plan and begin to, you know, to pivot into that next phase. Hopefully, as a nation, we will have emerged from COVID. And as we talked about before, ACS has to play a central role in reengaging the population in screening. But by the time a year is gone, I hope we're already making progress in improving lives through the tripartite mission and have, have things to stand up to, to discuss with the, the, the nation as, as ACS already does uh, about the positive impact of what they do. So I think that the next phase of ACS will start to be more visible. By five years, I'm hoping that we have refined our strategies so that we're meeting the specialized needs of patients in different geographies. Again, the rural versus urban uh, you know, type of, of um, tailoring that ACS should be part of leading for the understanding and leading to mitigate. Uh, as part of that, I, I know ACS uh, under my leadership and in the, in the previous leadership has a real interest in reducing cancer disparities that has to be a component of what it is that we do. And I'd like to have a measurable impact on that 
again, as a scientist and as a business person, um, I do believe in metrics of success planned out a priori at the time that the planning and uh, is completed. I'd like to increase our impact in cancer prevention. Obviously, that's where we want to go. And, and again, tailor resources toward near-term patient benefit. I think that's really the role of ACS. By 10 years, okay, let's be very aspirational. A big okay. win in 10 years is that declines in cancer mortality allow us to start to shift resources increasingly toward quality of life and cancer survivorship. So, you know, if we will, it, you know, if that's where we are 10 years from now, and you and I are going to sit down and have this conversation, then that will be a win for the cancer community as a whole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what about money? How is that uh, going to work? Yeah, well, obviously resources have to come in in order, for, in order for us to achieve resources have to come in. But again, I think that's where sharpening our focus and have and making strategic choices of what can ACS do that's unique to this organization? What differentiates us? And then what are the things that we partner with, for example, with other organizations who are interested in research, uh, but also, you know, pharma and cancer centers? And, you know, how do we optimize that partnership, I think, has to be part of it as well. So there's there's resources, but that, you know, fund the things that are truly ACS driven but thought also unique partnerships can be utilized as a way um, to achieve goal. And, and that has to be part of the plan too. Yeah, well, I mean, just looking at this as a kind of a natural comparator is St. Jude because they were at the same spot in 2007 and, uh, and ACS, as ACS and ACS went down, St. Jude went way up. So something went right there that went wrong with ACS and that may very well be vision or uh, or some connection to the world. Yeah, well, it may be, you know, the two, I, I have a great love for both organizations, deep love for both organizations and they have a slightly different place in, you know, in the universe. St. Jude's actually does ca uh, cancer care delivery for a specialized population. You know, ACS has an impact, a, a, you know, an impact on a much larger uh, group of, of individuals and communities in the U.S., but they both have their place in the place in the universe and, and also finding ways for those two organizations to work more optimally together, I think, can be a goal moving forward. So St. Jude's uh, has made very clear um, their impact on the pediatric cancer population, and we are better off for it as a nation and as a world. I believe the same at ACS. I believe that we are better off for the funding that, re that ACS has given to transformative research, to the funding that has gone toward passing new legislation or impacting uh, local, to local state and national policies that increase access to cancer care and improve equity, reduce fi financial toxicity. The advocacy arm has been incredibly effective, but again, the, the patient support component of providing navigation, providing transportation, providing lodging to families who are undergoing a cancer experience. I can tell you from my experience in Philadelphia, that's impact. And it is impact that is felt deeply um, by the families and the providers alike. It's irreplaceable. And it's the case that that aspect of, of ACS is something that uh, is truly differentiates the organization. And so, you know, these are, what I hope at the end of the day is that my microcosm experience in Philadelphia is what the world begins to know about ACS because what I see is an incredibly positive, irreplaceable organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's all about vision, isn't it? Um, is there anything we forgot? Uh, anything you'd like to mention? Well, you know, maybe, maybe maybe we start, you know, or we end how we began, which is the ACS, you know, why do they exist? They exist because the burden of cancer is unacceptably high. One in two men, one in three women over their lifetime with a cancer diagnosis is too much. And that the ACS tripartite strategy is to improve lives. And I, I think that they have a great start on that. They have a terrific history on that. And now we tailor for the future. But, you know, not to be forgotten, they've given out $5 billion in research funding since 1946. You know, this is a really significant investment in time and resources with, uh, you know, more than 3 million patients and lives touched by direct to ACS, uh, in, you know, direct to ACS programs. So, you know, tailoring that for 2021 and beyond is, is what I'm really looking forward to. 
um, you know, I'd, I'd love to continue this dialogue with you too. Uh, you know, I always find it useful to talk to you, Paul. Uh, it gives me new ideas about how it is that the organizations I'm working with, now Jefferson, soon to be ACS, um, can better work together toward a common goal. I really believe that that's the answer. Well, this is fascinating. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Paul.